So thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to keep letting people into the uh, from from the uh, waiting room. Uh, and if everyone could just stay on on uh, mute, that would be very helpful. Um, there's always some funny conversations that are going on when they're not on mute. So let's try and keep everyone on mute. Um, again, as, as we, we've just been talking about uh, back to schools with Paulina and, and Dr. Rob here, we've started doing this probably every couple of weeks now because I think it's really helpful. Uh, and the feedback we're getting from providers is to kind of hear from fellow providers about the testing, how people are integrating it into their practices and some good case studies. And that's really been the the uh, the main aim of this. So we're very fortunate we've got many providers and I think it's great to get them to coming on and uh, and talk to fellow providers about how they're utilizing the testing, what supplementation they are and everything else. And to that end, we're very lucky that we've got Dr. Rob um, Silverman with us today. Um, he's gonna go through um, what I would call uh, the KBMO triple threat or uh, three options, uh, which is the fact that we're now looking at obviously the food sensitivity testing. We've got the gut barrier panel as well, which is looking at immune health. And then with our latest testing, the CIT test, the cardiovascular information test, he's also going to talk about that. And more importantly, you know, where those uh, three Venn diagrams kind of overlap uh, and then some of the supplementation that he's already uh, used, utilizing with those tests and some case studies, which he's uh, always really good at uh, coming up with as well. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Rob uh, and I will, uh, I'll play uh, backup, backup uh, singer here to him uh, in terms of making sure we add all these other great people who are coming in as well. Over to you, Dr. Rob. Thanks so much, James. It's always a pleasure uh, to spend some time talking about the KBMO diagnostic tests. They are without question the backbone and the baseline of what I do in my functional medicine practice here in New York. Um, interestingly enough, I do believe everybody should ask some questions. You're gonna see, as uh, James said, a Venn diagram, you're gonna see how all three tests are truly interconnected and how you can base your whole baseline practice on step one, step two, and step three. So for me, as everybody knows, the gut is the epicenter of your health. So I called the uh, webinar Gut Matters, revealing the connection between the gut and cardiovascular health. So let's dig in. I'm going to try and keep it under 60 minutes. Going to leave time for some questions. I know James, like he said, James is a backup singer right now. He will be answering any questions online. Anything specifically that you want me to answer, he can let me know and or we can wait to the end and go over it, whatever flows. And uh, like I said, we'll hit it about the 45 minute mark. Hippocrates once said, all disease begins in the gut. It was about 2000 years ago or so. Alessio Fasano, who found the zonulin protein said, all disease begins in the leaky gut. I think we've encapsulated the right statement to start this particular webinar off with. So the KBMO triple threat. It's a food inflammation by the FIT test. So it's really more than just a food inflammation test. Now, I look at it as inflammation because I believe that inflammation is the backbone of uh, the problems that we see in most of our patients. If I had a specific mantra, it would be to manage and modulate inflammation. I do believe that food and food sensitivities are without question one of the hidden reasons for inflammation. Um, food sensitivities, as we all know, from the time to ingestion to the time the symptomology expresses itself, it's about a 72-hour wait. So again, how can a patient really know if they eat today, Tuesday, on Friday, they have some symptomology and some raised inflammation? Now, how could I, as a practitioner, know? So obviously, it really exemplifies the idea of test and don't guess. You, there's a direct tie-in with the food inflammation and immune health via the gut barrier panel. So the gut barrier panel is interesting in that we're gonna test for zonulin, occludin, candida, and LPS. And we're gonna test for them in two different dynamics. We're gonna test for them in IgA antibodies, IgG antibodies, one through four, and the most inflammatory stable molecule in the body, C3D. So we're gonna be actually be testing all three immune functions because it's immune system is really three lines of defense. The first one is the digestive tract because it's been stated that the first time the outside world meets the inside world is when something goes through the digestive tract. And then you're gonna be testing the second and the third part of those uh, defense mechanisms, the innate and the adaptive immunity. And you can do that all via the GP, um, the gut barrier panel. And lastly, 
the gut barrier panels affect food sensitivities effect on cardiovascular health. The gut may be a window into cardiovascular health. And I'll show you some interesting ties and how you would want to really take a step back and add to the cardiovascular testing, some gut testing as well. So let's start out with some clinical studies. You know, we're all docs and we all love the studies. And here's a study about IBS and food sensitivities. Utilizing the FIT test, and the FIT test, as we all know, is based on IgG one through four plus the C3D immune complexes. And I will, in the succeeding slides, get a little granular and break that down. So the results of the studies are interesting. The IBS severity score was done by a visual analog scale. So it looked at pain in reference to abdominal pain, at pain in, in the abdomen over days, bloating, and bowel habit. And when you looked at the, the control group versus the intervention group, the intervention group did three times as well. So what is that saying? When you remove the foods or foods that you were sensitive to, you had an inc increase, decrease. Let me say that more clearly. You had a decrease of abdominal pain in days, bloating, and bowel habit. So food was removed and people felt better. There was no supplement ads added. There were no drugs. There was no exercise. The only amelioration was food. Homocysteine markers. Homocysteine, we know, is a stroke marker. Much homocysteine is elevated due to the MTHFR gene being over under methylated. However, food also affects homocysteine, which is an inflammatory marker. When you look at the control group, when nothing was done, the control group on people's current trajectory when they ate foods that they were sensitive to, they increased their numbers of homocysteine to a very um, hazardous level, whereas the intervention group decreased them. So imagine if you were to test somebody for food sensitivity and they had homocysteine on the CIT test. Interesting in that if you remove the food sensitivities and the homocysteine went down, it would be something that a lot of um, doctors would look at and go, wow, I did not know the direct tie, but the body's all inter connected. Now, of course, there's supplements you could add to that, and the supplements would be methylated B vitamins, et cetera. The third number to look at is C-reactive protein, tissue inflammatory marker. And again, it's five times the decrease when you removed your food sensitivity. So the takeaway is, through this little bit of a dissertation, you remove foods, you had changes in inflammatory markers that were serum-based, which were quite objective, just from a food sensitivity. So let's jump in the idea of the tight junctions being damaged via zonulin and occluded. They found out that tight junction damage or this downregulation of junctural proteins, interestingly enough, led to a higher incidence of the expression of LPS, lipopolysaccharide. I have a nickname for LPS. I call it El Diablo, the devil, because if that is expressed, chaos and mayhem typically ensues. So when you're testing a gut barrier panel, and you see a problem with your tight junction, that also can imply that the expression of LPS can get into the bloodstream and cause a lot of deleterious effects. Here's a great slide on the interplay between low-grade endotoxemia and vascular disease. Please make note, look, and I'm, I'm pointing, so I'm your mirror, look at the right side where this LPS gets to the liver. So interestingly enough, LPS is expressed in the bloodstream. 75% of the toxins that get from the gut to the liver go through the bloodstreams and 25% goes via the portal vein. LPS travels in both those routes. So if you have a problem with your liver, and we all know that whatever you do to your gut, you do to your liver, whatever you do to your liver, you do to your gut, you're not gonna be able to detoxify and break down the LPS. On the converse, if you don't have something wrong with your liver and an overexpression of LPS, LPS will damage biliary excretion. So something for down the line, since we have so many webinars, the liver's effect on all these different things in reference to the gut and some of these other markers would be interesting. The mechanism of LPS-mediated atherosclerosis. It has been stated that the expression of LPS increases the incidence of heart disease three times, and it does so by stimulating toll-like receptor 4, LPS actually activates TOLAC receptor 4. TOLAC receptor 4 stimulates NF-kappa B and NLRP3 inflammasome, so it creates inflammation, 
We all know that cholesterol is not necessarily the problem. It's more of a friend than a foe. It's the inflammation that goes with the right kind of cholesterol that can cause the plaquing. In addition, toll-like receptor 4 stimulates something called toll-like receptor 2. I will have some slides to show this. We need to do this twice. Toll-like receptor 2 has reference to plaquing. And lastly, this really pontificates a great slide where you're really looking at how LPS is expressing inflammation in the immune system. And we all know that the gut and the, is, it has 80% of your immune cells and it commutes directly with our bloodstream on its outside. So when LPS gets out, it's inflammatory. Shaping the gut microbiota and cardiovascular benefits. So obviously we all have a foot or jumped in the whole body into the concept of functional medicine. So it really expresses how genetically engineered probiotics, really pre and probiotics, that's why the idea of fibers there. Incidentally, if someone were to ask me the new hack, not that it's new, but the new hack, if you will, especially the longevity health hack, it would be consume more fiber, more prebiotics. The increase of 10 grams of fiber decreases the incidence of mortality by 14%. So the top 23% of Americans in this study that consume fiber decreased the mortality rate by 49. So we always want to share a protocol, a solution with the test because the test is going to reveal some things that need to be changed. So eating a good diet, obviously some supplements will decrease metabolic syndrome, inflammation, atherogenic lipid profiles, hence improving cardiovascular health. This slide really exemplifies, once again, healthy gut, healthy heart. So some triggers of increased gut permeability, antibiotics. Now, I know this might, this might sound like a double negative. I'm not, an, I'm not anti to antibiotics. Clearly, they have their place. We all know that antibiotics are nuclear weapons to the gut. They blow everything up in all bacteria and they don't leave much left. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't take antibiotics. It, should, it just means that we may want to test post utilization of antibiotics and we may want to take some pre-probiotics and do some things to help the gut afterwards. Acid blocking drugs. This is where I really like to drop an anchor because acid blocking drugs, we have a lot of medical doctors out there will say four to six weeks. Unfortunately, many patients have the opportunity to get them over the counter and they do months, years. I have a couple of patients that just came in that actually been on acid blocking drugs for a couple of decades. And clearly that's too long. I'm sure if I had my uh, camera up where I could see everybody, um, everybody's head would be shaking. So acid blocking drugs lead you down a path of leaky gut, lead you down a path of compromised blood brain barrier. NSAIDs, non steroid anti inflammatories. They are Aleve, Advil, ibuprofen. They decrease pain, but they impair healing. Nutraceuticals decrease pain and promote healing. Which do you prefer, Mr. and Mrs. Patient? Heavy metal exposure and environmental toxins also lead you down a path of uh, increased uh, gut permeability. Concussion, something I treat a lot in my office. 60% of people with concussion either have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth and or leaky gut. So whatever you do to your brain, you do to your gut. Everybody that has a concussion patient, you need to do the gut barrier panel minimally. Cesarean birth, obviously, the bacteria on the skin is vastly different than the bacteria in the vaginal flora. Liver toxicity, you alluded to that before. Whatever you do to your gut, you do to your liver. Whatever you do to your liver, you do to your gut. Gut dysbiosis, easy definition. Uh, to avoid gut dysbiosis, you need about 85%, 85.1% of good bacteria. Interesting. When we test for the candida in um, the gut barrier panel, the gut barrier panel mimics a lot of gut dysbiosis and candida. So if you have candida, you usually have gut dysbiosis. An overgrowth of candida, incidentally, uh, to lay the groundwork, is small intestinal fungal overgrowth, or CFO. 97% of CFOs come from candida, gut barrier panel. And food sensitivities. As I said before, I firmly believe that one of the reasons for chronic hidden inflammation is the consumption and not the testing to ascertain food sensitivities. Yeast and bacteria overgrowth, again, speaking of candida, chronic stress, sleep deprivation, chronic inflammation, alcohol, 
Glunin and Gary, I know I may not win any popularity contest in this statement. We really should remove glutin and dairy, certainly in America, from our diets, sugar, artificial sweeteners. And again, good call out, screaming out the FIT176 test, looking for food additives and emulsifiers. James knows I love this slide because it has my name on it and I could spend hours on it, but let's just have a very epigrammatic view of my gut matrix. So we're looking at what could conceivably cause leaky gut. Well, food sensitivities, yeast, and dysbiosis. When we're talking about leaky gut, we're talking about the intestinal tract, most predominantly the small intestine. It's really not small, it's excessively long. It's about 22 feet, it's 90 to 95% uh, of the length. It has a single layer epithelial cell that has the thickness of a wet paper towel, if you will. Think of a screen door or a screen door on your back door. If it's in pristine condition, things pass that are supposed to pass. What's supposed to pass the small intestine is small digestible food particles, vitamins, minerals, and water. When there's a hole in your screen door, i.e. your small intestine, typically large undigested food particles pass through bacterial viruses and the like, and obviously leaky gut leads you to localized inflammation, possibly systemic inflammation, and ultimately maybe autoimmunity. If your gut is compromised, you have a chemical overload and extra toxins, you'll have liver dysfunction and the reverse is true. If you have leaky gut, you'll have a higher incidence of blood sugar problems, insulin resistance. Yes, leaky gut and hemoglobin A1C are directly related. Leaky gut leads you down a path also of um, increased incidence of obesity. Thyroid because autoimmunity. 75% of my patients that have thyroid problems have a leaky gut. Now, I'm a chiropractor. Everybody knows um, leaky gut leads to an overexpression of cytokines. Those cytokines lead to an overexpression uh, of arthritis and joint pain. MMPS, matrix metalloproteinases, are expressed in a large amount because of leaky gut. They're your body's own proteolytic enzymes that eat fibrocartilage at the time of injury. Fibrocartilage, like your disc, so there's a gut to disc axis, there's a gut to joint axis and there's a gut to meniscus axis. Everybody knows the gut to brain axis. I call it the super highway to health. Whatever you do to gut, you do to brain. Whatever you do to brain, you do to gut. Happy gut, happy brain, happy gut, happy life. And lastly, cardiovascular. So cardiovascular um, poses an issue because of what's beeping LPS, lipopolysaccharide, has been indicated to increase cardiovascular disease by three times. So there's a gut to heart axis. So let's talk a little bit about IgG and C3D food sensitivities as I try and pick the pace up. So we talk about IgG. Everybody knows a food sensitivity is an IgG test. Where KBMO is quite unique is they not only do IgG, they do IgG 1 through 4. In addition to testing IgG 1 through 4, which now you're testing the adaptive immune system, they're also test for, and they're the only company that I know of that has a patented technology that, has, that allows them to test for a dual pathway. That second pathway is the innate immune system, and they're able to do it because they're testing through a stable inflammatory molecule, the most stable inflammatory molecule called C3D, and that is a complement cascade pathway. This slide, we could spend hours on. It's illuminating for me. However, the basic premises, C3D and these immune complexes actually lead to increased inflammation. So the takeaway here is, and I never knew this before I started to use the test five years ago, that antibodies actually, when they're called out in an overexpression or for a period of time, will also release, release inflammation. And that kind of makes a lot of sense. So now you're testing a food against both legs of the immune system I mean, you're going to have a tremendous confidence interval of um, accuracy for inflammation. And here we go. Most of the companies are on the left. They're testing for IgG and really only IgG 1 through 2. KBMO was testing for a dual pathway where they're testing for this enhanced conjugate dual pathway where they're testing for both IgG 1 through 4 and C3D and they're testing two pathways of the three lines of defense. The gut barrier panel will be the third. Now, one of the things that I really like 
the ease in which I can understand the fit test. It's color coordinated. Now, if I can understand it, I'm able to elucidate a clear message to the patient. They have the visual um, idea and in, in the, in the visual colors. So for instance, red is plus four, heightened of inflammation. Orange is plus three, high levels of inflammation. Yellow, a warning sign. We all know yield, be careful, a plus two. For me, interesting, the lime green, it's a cross between the yellow and a cross between the green, something that we all could discuss at a later date. And of course, green means go, keep eating it. Also on the right, they've got aspartame, MSG, polysorbate 80, and the such. Within that, you're testing for additives and food emulsifiers. So for me, the test, because it's so clear, so color coordinated, becomes quite evocative. And people go, oh boy, look at that. It's great. So it almost, almost doesn't need me to interpret it. People just want to do, know what to do to get rid of the red, the orange, and the yellow. So when does a provider need to order the KBM or gut barrier panel? Personally, every time I order the fit test, I order the gut barrier panel. There are times that I order just the gut barrier panel. Um, and in those times, here's what it would be, where if somebody had food sensitivities test. So they are, we already know they have food sensitivities. In addition to that, you're trying to rule in and out, or either you know they have IBS, IBD, they have celiac disease, they have SIBO, because as we know, leaky gut doesn't cause SIBO. SIBO can cause leaky gut. Post-concussion, 60%, again, are damaged from a concussion, digestive and skin issues, weight loss and weight gain, autoimmune conditions, joint and disc injuries, chiropractors, naturopaths, manual therapists, people who deal with musculoskeletal. The gut is the doorway into musculoskeletal injuries. I try and tell my brother in this every day and I'm always on my 12-hour seminars on the weekend. Brain fog, fatigue, neurodegenerative disease. All neurodegenerative diseases have an origin in the gut. They're bi-directional and they're autoimmune. Autism, 90% of people that have ASD have a gut dysfunction, liver dysfunction, blood sugar issues, cardiovascular concerns. And lastly, you should have the beep, beeping red light, the condition that causes the second most disability days, migraines. So here's the gut barrier panel. I heard James say something excellent. There's really eight markers here. And I never looked at it like that till he said this yesterday and he's right. We have candida, zondolin, and occludin, and LPS. And we've got two markers of each of them. So four plus times two equals eight. So candida, as we know, is a yeast. Everybody has some. It's the problem is the overgrowth. So when it overgrowth, it communicates yeast with your immune system, hence driving up immune factors. Zonulin, everybody can see me, zonulin occluded. Zonulin, here is an epithelial cell. Here is an epithelial cell in your gut. They meet together. It's a tight junction. I can't see you. It's a tight junction. Zonulin is the functional pull of this tight junction. So it's pulling apart because of function. It has to go first. Occluding is the fibers. It's my fingers. And they pulled apart. So zonulin makes the tight junction looser, which can cause occluding to make it a loose junction. LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Holds gram-negative bacteria in the inside of the intestinal wall. Believe it or not, it's very salubrious on the inside of the intestinal wall. However, when it's expressed, it now becomes very inflammatory. And it does so because on the inside of the intestinal wall, it stimulates interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory interleukin, which shuts off the expression of interleukin-1-beta interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and TNF-alpha. The reverse is true when LPS is expressed. Now, the gut barrier panel, you have IgA1 and 2. IgA is mucosal lining. And at that mucosal lining, um, it means there's damage to the mucosal lining, nose, lung, and of course, gut. IgG1 through 4 and C3D really do the dual purpose. Now, IgG is elevated over a duration of time. So IgA is initial at the gut level. IgG means it's a period of time. And C3D means the innate immune system was called in to help. It's complement cascade. Inflammation is up. So clearly, candida is posing an issue here. Zonulin is at the gut level. It hasn't affected occluding. 
unfortunately, LPS is elevated over a duration of time. So we'll talk about a couple of case studies that go with it. Candida, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to get to the CIT. And I do see a population of uh, questions in the chat that I may need to answer. Um, that said, Candida, um, when the environment is right, yeast can multiply and grow out of control. Grows when bacteria is suppressed or immune system is weakened. Zonulin, gliadin and intestinal bacteria, the main triggers for zonulin release. Interesting in that everybody says here to me, can I eat gluten? My answer is no. Look at the protein. Look what it does. Zonulin is a protein synthesized in intestinal liver cells. Key biomarker for intestinal permeability. Only reversible regulator of intestinal permeability. Look at the litany of conditions, but let's circle obesity. Before you see the next slide, I will tell you, I believe that zonulin is a longevity hack. It's one of the biomarkers of health. It's on my list of 15, as well as LPS. I will believe that zonulin also is a marker of overall health in that Increased levels of zonulin are associated with obesity, as we said before, gastrointestinal issues, higher waist circumference, diastolic blood pressure, fasting glucose, and an increased risk of metabolic disease. So you could see why you want to take a gut barrier panel in addition to a food sensitivity test, how it really can set the stage, light the fire to start the cardiovascular markers to be elevated. Now, one of the takeaways here is the zonulin antibody that uh, KBMO utilizes. It eliminates the cross-reactivity. It's a unique recumbent zonulin protein, eliminating haptoglobin, procodine, and, and a complement fragment cross-reactivity. Positivity rate eliminates zonulin blocking and low positivity rates. Bottom line here is many people want to test the FECO matter for zonulin. It is not an effective way to get an accurate zonulin test. Blood and venous are the effective ways. And in that blood venous, it's also blood spot or serum. So initially, a lot of people inquired about the blood spot because there were questions on its accuracy. The NIH has said that it's a statistical tie between the blood spot and serum. And for someone like me in New York, not in Connecticut, I'm licensed in both states, I can't physically draw, I would have to send them out the blood spot is great. Not only that, not only because of the accuracy, I do a lot of online. You can send it to people's houses and they can um, just with a little stick, I'll have a, a little finger stick, pop out um, a couple of blood spots for the different tests and they can do it and you can build a virtual practice on just testing that alone. So occludin is a barrier function to regulate transport. Basically occludin is open in response to zonulin. The clinical gem is occludin is essential in tight junction stability. Together, zonulin and occludin really are the gatekeepers of tight junction proteins. When they're functioning well, your tight junctions are intact. LPS, I kind of alluded to it before, but here's LPS. LPS is expressed. It attaches to something called toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4 stimulates NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is a signal transducer of inflammation, which releases interleukins. There's another signal um, that stimulates the NLRP3, and LPS also can damage mitochondria. So the release of LPS can cascade to inflammation and fatigue in a large amount. Now, in addition, as I said before, now you can see it, toll-like receptor 4 stimulates toll-like receptor 2. The stimulation of toll-like receptor 4 is the placking. So now you've got LPS stimulating inflammation and placking it's no wonder that you want to also test for LPS with your cardiovascular inflammatory markers. So this is a brief overview of LPS. As I said before, it's um, on the out, out, outer surface of the membrane. 80% of your um, gram-negative bacteria are pathogenic. It's an endotoxin. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Here's two points of note. LPS is present in triglyceride-rich, very low VLDLs, and it's also a component of biofilms. Biofilms are bacteria igloos, which encapsulate a lot of bacteria. The NIH has talked about biofilms being the main reason 
for the inability to get rid of bacteria. So practitioners, if you don't use a biofilm buster, you're not going to get the clinical outcomes when you test to see if somebody's got leaky gut, et cetera. So LPS, L LPS stimulates and affects the joint, immune modulation, the heart, the liver, the thyroid, and in this one, even the brain, lung, and metabolic disorders. So gut permeability leads to endotoxin absorption. And I put this slide in, and the reason I put this slide in, I wanted everybody to know that a paracellular pathway was the tight junction. Transcellular pathway is the epithelial lining. Now, what's the difference? Well, if you were to go back to your gut barrier panel and you would only see LPS elevated, but no tight junctions, it would mean that LPS came through the transcellular pathway, and that would mean that it's a longer period of time to heal. Whereas if you have the tight junctions open, LPS could have gone through the tight junctions and it's a shorter period of time in my clinical estimation to heal. Paracellular, transcellular, something I think that we could speak about in the future. I think it's real revealing on uh, which structure damages to the time frame of um, you're gonna heal somebody's gut lining. So again, gut barrier panel, just a reminder, Use it on every patient that walks in my office. So my 7R program, we've taken about half the webinar in, in a review and to really lay the groundwork. But the 7R program, real simple, I'll go through it quick, is reset. You want to reset your diet, your lifestyle, and your mindset. You want to remove unwanted pathogens. Here's where I remove unwanted pathogens. I use berberine, oregano oil, garlic, serum bovine immunoglobin, and a biofilm buster. This is also a part where you want to make sure you remove all your fluid sensitivities. It's another part where you have this old, age old decision of practitioners, do you remember detox or gut? Put them together because now we know that gut and liver go together. We see that with LPS. So therefore you would also do some detox. The second and the fourth legs or the second and the fourth R's are the most important. The third R is remove digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, stomach acids, and bile. The increase, in, the increase flow to bile will allow you to decrease your incidence of leaky gut, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and also lower your cholesterol markers. Regenerate. Here's where you want to heal and seal your gut lining through a plethora of nutrients that are pleiotrophic, that allow for anti-inflammation in the area, and also, again, heal and seal that uh, wall, that gut lining. The fifth R is re-inoculate with quality pre and probiotics. Don't take probiotics without prebiotics. Make sure you take a prebiotic. Let's eat some fermented foods. Prebiotics feed the probiotics, which make what we call postbiotics. This should really be reintroduce and or retest. So yes, you can retest. Again, I do. I like to retest. If for some reason that you can't retest or you want to double check your test, you would reintroduce one food at a time over a three-day period. If someone has about 10 food sensitivities, that's going to take 30 days. But if that's where you're at or that's where you're at with the patient, there's your option. And lastly, retain your health and GI integrity. And you could do so with a super five of a methylated multivitamin mineral, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D3 with K2, pre and probiotics, and a quality GI restored drink. So Candida, this is something new. I don't think you guys have been exposed to this. So if you just have an elevation in candida, here is where you would want to add caprylic acid, C8, oregano oil, berberine, garlic, SBI, and probiotics that are of the lactobacilli strain. If it's zonulinoclunin that's elevated, probiotics like B. longum, zinc carnosine is a hidden gem. It's a secret sauce. L-glutamine, collagen peptides, curcumin, glucosamine HCL. KBMO has partnered. James, I'm sure, will come on at the end and really explain this wonderful partnership. He's partnering with Nutridyne, so you have the protocols. I've actually written a lot of the protocols for Nutridyne. I do work with Fullscript. You know, um, they are in partner with them. And Biotics, so you're looking at family-based companies in Nutridyne and Biotics that have been in business for about 45 years. So let's go through a case study. Um, the gut barrier panel. So you see a positive in candida, uh, IgA, positive zonulin IgA, occludin positive, and LPS positive. Now we could spend all the time, and I, I know we 
James and I have talked, we may go over a little bit today. So fair warning, there's a lot to cover, but I'm going to try and make it as tasty as I can. So here was my treatment, Dr. Rob's 7R program, which we went through, and I reevaluated again in six months. I went real hardcore. I blasted it in. I was aggressive. I removed all food sensitivities. Um, I also tested for these things, and six months later, came back all green. Green means go, obviously, and I um, was very happy with this outcome. So you, too, can test not guess, apply the products and the protocols that we have. If you need the exact protocol, I'm happy to share that with you. And you can get all greens. Believe me, this patient was very happy. They had been everywhere. It's just that no one really tested them with an accurate test and no one applied a protocol that was going to work for them, individualized and personalized. So my patient gave me a big thumbs up. The bottom line is the most effective clinical outcomes across all disease spectrums can result from the normalization of gut function. So early detection is critical. Can you believe 50% of people that have heart attacks have normal standard lipid profile the day of a heart attack? Factoid, heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women. This is the case in the U.S. and worldwide. We all talk about Alzheimer's and what we should. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death. And yes, Alzheimer's without question kills more people combined than prostate and breast cancer. Number one is still cardiovascular disease. People in my age group in their 50s are, especially men, it's our leading cause of disease. So one of those, are you kidding me? In that people just don't, you know, the AHA said 49% correctly identified heart disease as the number one killer. So more than half of America, that was the only study I was able to get, are still unaware that cardiovascular disease is what kills most people. So they were asked why, and here's the statement in January of 2024, people may not want to acknowledge heart disease as a leading cause of death because many risk factors for heart disease require lifestyle modifications that are hard to do, such as losing weight, stop smoking, and consuming a heart-healthy diet. So basically, people aren't testing, people aren't aware, the doctors are not pushing them enough, and nobody wants to change their lifestyle. But when they come in my office, and as I speak to my colleagues, people are looking for help. So I think, you know, we need to delve into some of these tests and really test and don't guess. So here's a KBMO vascular inflammatory test cardiovascular inflammatory test. So advanced lipid testing, direct LDLC. I'm going to go into detail. This is a game changer, everybody. Most of these LDL testing happens to be a calculated form. Again, I've got a whole slide dedicated to that. HDLC, total cholesterol, triglycerides. Yes, total cholesterol has its place. It has more of its place in a ratio than an individual standalone marker. Non-HDLC, lipid ratios of total cholesterol over HDL and HDLC over triglycerides, APOB, APOB and LP little a. Little story, sorry, James, I'm probably gonna go over. I was sitting next to a medical doctor um, on a plane and we were in first class and I was giving a cardiac uh, lecture. It turned out that he was gonna be at the cardiac lecture. They wanted to bring an outside source. So within that, he was, burning a hole. I'm a New York guy. He's burning a hole over my shoulder. So I turned around and I said to him, what kind of physician are you? And he said, you know, I'm a cardiologist. And we realized he was coming. And I said to him, let me ask you one question. Nobody, you know, 35,000 feet, we are in the true cone of silence. Which markers are the most important markers? And he said, there's two markers that I tell everybody to take and almost nobody takes them. ApoB and LP little a. And we'll go into more detail now. Metabolics, testing for glucose, hemoglobin A1C, homocysteine, and inflammation, HSC reactive protein. So here's what a CIT test looks like. Here you have your lipid tests, your lipid profiles, everything. You've got your red, you've got your yellow, and you've got your green. And that's page two. Homocysteine's on page two or at the bottom. We just didn't have enough room when I made up the uh, slides. So why would we take LD, direct LDL? Well, direct LDL cholesterol distinctly measures LDL cholesterol in the blood. So the number, it is what it is. It's accurate. Most lipid panels, 
do LDL cholesterol estimating using an equation involving other cholesterol measurements. There's your measurements. There's your formula. So the problem with it is it's about 20% less accurate than direct LDL. Why? Because it's really based on a lot of triglycerides. So if triglycerides go up, which most Americans, and I'm quoting American because I live in America, most Americans have triglycerides that are through the roof. This calculated LDL is over-exaggerated. If it's too low, you're not getting the right number. This is a game changer. Testing for L direct LDL. I was going over with one of my friends yesterday, medical uh, doctor. He runs a hospital. And I said, I've got a test that tests direct LDL. And he just was like, why don't we do that more? And there's your takeaway. So APOB, it's the best single predictor of risk for a heart attack and stroke. What is APOB? APOB carries all the bad guys, all the bad types and particles of cholesterols in one fell swoop. So it's the boat is the Titanic and the passengers are all these different types of um, cholesterol, LDL particles. Every particle of danger, dangerous cholesterol is wrapped by APOB. Less than 5% of Americans have been tested for this. I tell all my patients, if they're not gonna let me do their blood, please, when they go to the doctor, ask for the APOB. It's easy to remember, APOB, bad, boo. APOA, A, like Fonzie, good. LP little a, sticky lipids where there's turbulence in arteries, it's glue. LP little a elevates affected up to 25% of the population. 40% of relatives have the marker. Less than 1% of the Americans have tested for LP little a. You know, it is shocking to me when I ask many of my colleagues, have they tested for APOB? and LP little a, and no, these are standard bearers. This really elevates the test to another stratosphere. So I'm not gonna go through the ratios. This is for um, your advancement. So the total cholesterol over HDL ratio, better indicator of plaque impact. HDLC over triglyceride ratios, 70% plaque forming patients have insulin resistance. 90% of insulin resistant patients go undiagnosed. HDLC over triglycerides, ratio predicts this sooner that, than fasting glucose or hemoglobin A1C. High sensitive C-reactive protein, it's a heart attack marker. Health is associated, as we all know, with inflammation. The FIT test, the, the CIT test, it's a strong contributor from excessive fat in around organs, visceral fat. I actually test for visceral fat in my office. Visceral fat not only indicates high C-reactive protein, it also indicates damage to the blood-brain barrier. So this is a great eclectic test. The body's all interconnected. It's common in prediabetes and diabetics. And there, there are your numbers. Again, these are references for everybody to go to. They're on your um, CIT test. Fasting glucose is a snapshot. It's normal for 20 years or more years before a diabetes diagnosis. Hemoglobin A1C is giving your average blood sugar over a 90 to 120 day period with an emphasis on the last 30 days. It is without question the test that's utilized for prediabetes, diabetes, and for me also should be a basis for metabolic syndrome. Homocysteine, now interesting with homocysteine, we talked about it before, it's a normal breakdown of proteins, it's a stroke marker. Homocysteine is again, really adversely affected by foods and food sensitivities. It's an inflammatory marker and inability to methylate. Early detection and treatment is without question essential. So let's get into it. What supplements might help these issues that we talked about? So here's my Dr. Rob's blood sugar protocol, low sugar diet, eat clean, GPS, DNA, GPS, no gluten, no processed food, no ultra processed food, no added sugar. 63% of Americans get their calories from ultra-processed food. The average American consumes 160 pounds of sugar per year. DNA, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweeteners, no vegetable oils, or should I say industrialized seed oils, and no deep-fried foods. You do those eight things, you've just given somebody a $1,500 nutritional consultation. Alpha lipoic acid, which works with the water and the fat part of the cell, great for blood glucose, it would be part of my Ozempic protocol. Glucose support, chromium, taurine, acetyl L-carnitine, green tea also. 
berberine pre and probiotics, the probiotics of note that have really shown to really positively affect sugar protocols or acromancia or bacillus subtilis. And lastly, of course, omega-3 fatty acids. High homocysteine protocol, comprehensive formula supplying a biologically active form of folate, B vitamins, and NAC. If elevated blood vitamin, if elevated blood lipids add niacin, red yeast rice, phytosteroids, and pre and probiotics with acromancia and or bacillus subtilis. Cholesterol, lipid dyslipidemia, dysfunction. If LDL is, is elevated, and this also goes for LDL, little a, you'll see I have one in the other. LDL is elevated, niacin, omega-3s, natto, multivitamin, multimineral, red yeast rice, vitamin D3 with K2, phytosteroids, and do my 7R action plan for gut restoration. If you want to lower LP little a, you can do this naturally. I found patients, it's work. I have other practitioners that do it. It's common knowledge for people to say it doesn't. Unfortunately, statins have shown to elevate LP little a. Things that I've found the lower LP little a are, are the following. L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, ginkgo biloba, resveratrol, curcumin, flax seeds, and of course, limit your carbohydrates. So let's look at a case study, gut barrier panel, CIT results. So here we've got, once again, zonulin elevated for IgA. Both LPS is elevated, IgA and IgG and C3D. Please make note, this patient has tried multiple approaches and statin therapy. They've been on a two-year journey. They were at the end of their journey. They just said, you know what? I just don't know what to do and where to go. So here's the CIT results, direct LDL 180. Every, obviously everything's not just too high other than HR, HSCRP, everything's way too high. Direct LDL 180, triglycerides 192, APOB 137, LP little a 58, HSCRP 3.3, hemoglobin A1C 6.3. So he had an elevation to zonulin tight junctions and LPS run rampant. So here's my case study. Here was my protocol that I utilized. I did a modified 7-R program for the first three months. I fixed the gut. I used pre and probiotics and it was lactobacillus GG and S. Bilardi because that was what was warranted for this particular condition. I added polyphenols, omega-3 fatty acids, pro-resolving mediators. If you need some more information about that, I'm happy to discuss. Ketone bodies, a GI restore formula, and extra virgin olive oil. Then I went to the lipid protocol on months four to six, I added niacin, omega-3 fatty acids, red yeast rice, L-carnitine, curcumin, vital steroids, and I did the retained phase of my 7R action plan. So I retained the gut and they built towards the lipid protocol. Let's look at the gut barrier panel test, all negative. Let's look at the CIT results. Everything else that was good stayed good, the six out of the 13 markers that were bad, let's take a look. Direct LDL C 126 under 130, thumbs up. Triglycerides, for me, I want to see under 100, thumbs up, 90. APOB 74, fantastic. LP little a 33, it was 28. So that genetic marker went down. Remember, genes are not your destiny. They do load the gun, but they don't fire the gun. It's your environment. They're only 10 to 30%. So we can work around that. HSCRP below one, 0 0.8, and hemoglobin A1C at 5.3. Did you know that if you wanted your brain not to shrink, you need your hemoglobin A1C at 5.4 or less. Optimum is 5.2. In six months, this pre-diabetic slash diabetic went to somebody who had a number that was virtually perfect for brain health. So, CIT advantages, it's a dry blood spot. It's validated against serum testing. It has a 96% plus agreement. It's stable for 14 days. It gives patients another major screening tool to assess overall health and longevity. So the Venn diagram that James talked about, I switched it a little bit. I made it four parts. I said, start with the food inflammation via the FIT test. If you're really worried about, and this is where everybody's talking about, it is the incisive conversation of 2023, 24, and I believe 25, 
health and longevity, you need a food inflammation test. You want to do a test or gut barrier panel, immune health. And you also want to do a cardiovascular health for, by your CIT. So if you want everything to hit the health and longevity bullseye, those are your three tests all together. So here's a picture. The CIT test looks very much in its packet as um, the FIT test. There you see all the components of it. There is a blood spot tutorial. It is fantastic. Uh, I'll have James come on in a moment and really go over how to uh, do the blood. He does a great explanation of that. And it's very um, kind of him to actually allow us everybody a discount. Please use the Dr. Rob for the discount so they know where it came from. And we're able to see how effective webinars are in sharing the uh, knowledge bombs, if you will. So here's all your information. I'm going to open it up for questions right now. I see that it's been populated, and I'll just leave this as the last one. So James, let me know. We have a few minutes for questions. Perfect. Great job. Box? <laughs> let me uh, let me go through this for you. So the first one is from. Uh, James Panter here. Um, have have uh, have read fiber will increase LPS if you have to have too many gram negative microbes. Do you recommend gut rehab before introducing fiber increase? Is the first question. Well, I I don't mean to co be contrary. Here's what I've heard, and then let me answer it in the best way I can. I heard if we take in too much coconut oil, LPS can get increased. I didn't hear about fiber. As a matter of fact, I've heard the other thing. And, th and this is a great question because it's a great question. And it's a great question because the literature split. So my answer to you is, let's assume that the literature you have is correct. Do you recommend rehab before introducing fiber? My answer would be yes. Anything that would increase LPS, especially if it's expressed, I would try to avoid. Okay, perfect. The next one we've got um, from Vicky. Uh, is there a connection between narcolepsy and gut issues? You know, you really touched on something. And, you know, James, I, I guess I should have included it. And please make note for the next time we discuss food sensitivities. When you removed your food sensitivities in an IRB study, the number one symptomology that abated was all mental health. Now, narcolepsy may not be mental health, but without question, when you remove food sensitivities, you fix the gut, you take down inflammation, you're going to be in tune with your circadian rhythm and you're gonna get better sleep. The gut is critical. Now, that said, fixing the gut circadian rhythm is gonna help sleep. Great question. Another one here from James Pander again. Uh, what are biofilm busters? Uh, sorry, which biofilm busters do you use, Dr. Rob? So I would have to give you a list and I'm going to be frank. I did not memorize everything. So what I will do is I will take a picture of what we use via Nutridyne. There's two different formulas and we'll get that out to you via email or in the show notes afterwards. Yeah, perfect. And then uh, so- Biofilm busters- I'm sorry, the biofilm bus is, so biofilm are like an acorn. It's a bacteria igloo. It's like plaque in your teeth. So it breaks it open. And then you use something like a serum bovine immunoglobin, a non-cholesterol, and it comes and he mops it up. And you're going to see a tremendous increase in your clinical outcomes if you haven't used those type of supplements prior. Um, Silk here was asking about um, LPS protocols. If you go to the front page of the KBMO website, We've got two or three. There's a slide that Rob showed as well for Neutrodyne Biotics and also available on full script. So you can uh, point your patients in that direction as well. Um, Alina gave a great example that she had a patient um, who had a heart attack a day before extraction. She's a, she's a dentist. Uh, and again, she's now started using the test in the office to avoid the guessing and uh, making sure that she can test. So uh, that was very helpful. Uh, another quick question here from Carolyn asking about do you test fasting for CIT? And yes, it's a fasting test. So the standard 24 hours beforehand. Um, and then we've got another one here from Madeline. Um, since uh, high sense of CRP can also be associated with other inflammation in the body, how do you determine when this is a cardiac marker? You know, what I like most, and James, you're going to get a big compliment. What I like most about James 
is he's saying this is not the only test in the world. This is just a, you know, as we agree, a baseline test. So if you wanted to test and go in more depth, you could then go through a whole cardiac panel. However, you would have to add a lot of uh, other inflammatory markers. So I think with homocysteine, I think with HSCRP, you're getting an idea that you've got a problem with your heart, but I would, I would um, add other tests at that point. I would go into more detail. This is covering a wide array of issues. If you need to go deeper in one rabbit hole, you probably have to order some other serum tests. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I just add is, uh, as Dr. Rob showed up, the within the IBS study we did, high sensitive CRP was elevated there you know, for patients with IBS. So I think it's a generally a really good overall inflammatory marker. So as Dr. Rob says, it'll give you a great idea, is this patient inflamed or not? And to his point, if you want to then go down you know, and do other testing on, on the back of that, you can. But that interlink linking between IBS and cardiovascular is, and you know, that whole gut, as well as cardiovascular health, I think is, is, is pretty key there. And that's one of the reasons we measured that as part of that um, IBS study. Um, just so moving on to uh, times of the essence, um, do you recommend red yeast rice if cancer is present or yeast sensitivities? I would probably opt off that and I would go with something like a polycosinol. Um, could you note again what tests are included in the CIT, please? So, Rob, do you want to flip back to the slide just so we can show that one? Yeah. Let me do this. Be my guest. Everybody reads backwards, I know. There we go. So that's the panel. Now, we're going to send all these slides out as well. So, again, um, don't if you... Uh, you haven't got your phone to hand and you want to kind of take a quick picture now and um, that'll be available as well uh, in terms of uh, we'll send the slide deck out as well as as the um as well as this recording um question from agnes here um can you diagnose SIBO with the fit test dr rob no see th this is not a SIBO test right now the most accurate and i did accurate is a breath test but you can test for leaky gut and CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, because 97% of CFOs come from candida. Excellent. Um, Alina, again, wanted to know, are we doing this every month? We're doing a couple of these talks every month. Um, for those sharp-eyed amongst you, um, we have Polina who did the talk last week uh, next to Dr. Rob as well. Um, so again, if you haven't had a chance to listen to that one live, that's a really good talk. And so uh, thoroughly recommend that. So we're trying to do a couple of months um, just to kind of, and again, the, the emphasis on providers who run the test in their practices to kind of help you guys work out how's, what's a good way of implementing the testing into your practice. And then also for them to sh share some of their success stories. Uh, again, these, got, these, these are the best of the best. They don't have any horror stories, but uh, uh, again, the idea is to kind of uh, at least give you some sense of how to implement it, the types of uh, patients. And Paulina did a great one from a commercial standpoint as well, in terms of how you can, you know, hopefully make sure you're making some money, uh, given that we've all spent a lot of money on our education. So let's make sure we can monetize that um, versus just uh, the nice plaques on the wall. Although Dr. Rob's got a pretty good selection behind him. Um, a quick question here. What do you do with patients with curcumin sensitivity if you can't use uh, the gut healing supplements? If you can't use curcumin, there's still um, others that are NF uh, kappa B uh, decreasers, but you still have your omega threes, you still have your pro resolving mediators, you have your Boswellia. So there's ample stuff. So I, that has happened to me, um, and it's actually, I, I mean, Jay, I don't want to go into too much detail because we're short on time, but I, I tested for sardines. I was sensitive to sardines. I hate sardines. They're very healthy. I hate them. And I'm sitting there and go, what the heck, James? I don't need it, but I understand why. And he's like, what about your fish oils? And it turned out that my fish oils were coming from sardines, switched to the salmon oil, and hence all is good. Um, and Charlotte, who uh, we're very fortunate, we've got a great team of uh, people at KBMO UK. Um, Charlotte Hunter, who heads up that team, is, is on today as well. 
She's also saying here the UK webinars are pretty cool. So what I'll do is I'll make sure uh, we circulate that as well um, for the uh, early morning amongst you, uh, as well as more importantly, the recording. So we'll uh, get those out to everyone. She's been doing some great ones recently there as well. So the idea is, again, um, we're trying to make sure we've got uh, our UK, any of the UK providers on. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, cocktail hour. And then uh, the ones, uh, hopefully uh, the UK ones, we'll uh, make sure we record and send around to everyone as well. So I think that's it. Again, excellent questions. Thank you again, Dr. Rob. Very much appreciated for going through that. As I mentioned, we'll be sending out the slides, um, the recording uh, to make sure everyone's got access to that. And hopefully Dr. Rob will send that list of, uh, of, of busters as well. And we'll get that list uh, attached to the email that we'll get out. If not tomorrow morning, it'll be uh, the following day. I'll send it over to you today. Wonderful. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Much appreciated. And, uh, We'll look forward to uh, the upcoming ones in the next couple of weeks, and we'll send some more information out uh, attached to that email that we send out, hopefully tomorrow morning, if not uh, on Friday morning. So where uh, you've got, uh, you can hopefully put those in your diary in terms of uh, further events to do uh, in terms of up upcoming as well. Thank you, everyone. Cheerio.